All right, so first of all, we'd like to welcome all our Torah Anytime viewers from around the world for joining us. And uh, we'll begin with a part. I know we're learning tonight for Wash Lemas to Sabina Bina Bat Mervera, Mervari. Working on my accent, all right. And, um, and for anybody else who's either for Wash Lemas, the Shachol Israel. We are now doing part three of Dreams. So there's another, uh, this is obviously a follow up to part one and part two, which if you didn't hear it or you want to review it, it is on tour anytime for your convenience. All this selling. All right, now down to the Torah. So now, before we begin for, um, to, for the actual uh, class, I, I want to present, uh, there was a big, big rabbi by the name of Behuda Fataya, right, which we brought him a few times already before, but I want to actually speak about tonight about what he said. He had people that used to come to him about dreams also, and he gave dream interpretations as well. Right? And he was this tremendous, tremendous Kabbalist, right, about 100 years ago. So he wrote in his book, in Parashat Miketz, in Minchat Yehuda, he wrote a list of stories that people came to him, what their dreams and how he interpreted for them. So he said in, in, his, in, in the Sefa over there, he says, for the wise person, if you go read through this, you'll be able to figure out how to interpret dreams. So we're going to go through some of the stories that he brings down. And again, anybody else wants to look it up, you could always look it up. They have a, they have a copy of his Sefa in English. What's right? his name? Uh, Rabbi Huda Fataya. Fataya. And uh, his Sefa is called Minchat Yehuda. Okay. And it's uh, this, this place where we're actually reading from is his chapter 47 in the English edition, Pashat Miketz. Okay, so he says, first of all, when a person has a dream, a dream is always going to be very subtle. It's not going to be like bland out, like, oh, this is what exactly what you mean. So it's very subtle and it's very, uh, it's a, in a hint. It could either, and he br it brings three options. He says that it could either pertain to a distant time in the, in, the, in the many years in the future, or it could come to tell you, to give you rebuke for a certain sin that you did, or three, it could come to tell you between a husband, a man, and a wife. And these are the ones he's going to speak about particularly. So he said one time somebody came uh, to him, and he said that he dreamt, this man dreamt, that he, there's, there's tefillin for the, for the hand and there's tefillin for the rosh. Now what he, in his dream, he put the tefillin for the head on the tefillin for the hand, and the tefillin on the hand, he put on the, on the tefillin on the head. So he switched it. So he went to the rabbi and says, what does this mean? You know, him thinking probably, oh, look at that. I'm putting on tefillin in my sleep. That's probably amazing. And the rabbi says, that means that you have cohabited with your wife in an in natural, in uh, normal manner. And they're coming to, re to re being that your, your soul is on a very high level. They're coming to give you rebuke for this sin. So once he said that, he was like, you know, he actually admitted to it. He says, you know what, you're right. And he did shuvah on that. Another time, somebody came to him and he said that a man came and he saw that there was, uh, on three occasions, he saw worms coming out of his left thigh. So the rabbi told him, this means that you had relations with a Muslim woman three times. And again, he admitted to that, and he, uh, um, and he brings a uh, proof on how he got it with the psukim. So another time, there was, uh, there was a certain woman that used to uh, converse frequently with many Jewish and Gentile people alike. And one day, her husband had a dream, and in the dream, he dreamt that, that his wife was the wife of a high priest, which means a Kohen Gadol, like the highest, the, one of the holiest people in the generation. So he goes over to the rabbi and says, what does that mean? Why is, I dreamt that my wife is a wife of a high priest. And he said, the reason is because that your wife is no longer faithful for you. How do we know that? Because if a woman, if a, if a, a Kohen Gadol, he cannot go and if, if one of his seven relatives the, you know, die, he's not allowed to go and touch them which means he has to have somebody else go and bury them. As opposed to a regular Kohen, he could go for his close families and relatives, he could go and bury them, right? But in the older days, in the time of the Beit HaMikdash, Kohen Gadol was not even allowed to do anything. So he said, you know, you're considered, your wife is now considered a wife of a high priest, which means is that you cannot even become impure for her, which means that she's no longer yours. She already belongs to, you know, she already had uh, relations with somebody else. And uh, um, he also brings it down. He says, this, this one he didn't find out subsequently if it was true or not. Like Kohen Gadol? Kohen Gadol, Kohen Gadol, yeah. We don't have Kohen Gadol nowadays. We're talking about in the, in the olden days. So that means she had relations with Kohen Gadol? No, no, no. It means that she had relations. No, right now, he had, this dream happened about 100 years ago. So she had relations with somebody else. And she is considered like a wife of a Kohen Gadol, which means is that her husband's not allowed to get impure for her. Sort of a hint of saying that her husband is not really married to her uh, because of the sin that she did. Okay, there was also another time uh, where someone came over to him and he said that he had a dream that in his dream he took nine wicks and he had earthenware vessels. And he put the wicks inside these vessels and he lit them in the dream. And now he's thinking three in each, uh, each vessel. And then he's, he's looking at this and he's thinking, he's like, he's like why did I put it in an earthenware thing. If you want to put a lamp or you want to put something that's going to light a fire, you put it in a glass so it could light up the entire room. Why earthenware? You can't see anything. And he's sitting and he's pondering in his dream as why he put it in there. And then he woke up. So he was very nervous of this dream because he had four sons. 
and one of them died. And now he sees three, three, three additional uh, you know, earthenware vessels and the wicks, and it's not lighting so clearly. So he was very nervous about it. He went to the rabbi. The rabbi told him a, an interpretation, and he says, he's like, no, no, no. He's like, give me the real interpretation. He says, I, 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 yeah, I know what you're trying to do there. I want the real stuff. So he said, fine, I'll give you the real interpretation, but you have to, if it's true, you have to tell me that it's true. Right? You can't uh, you know, try to wiggle your way around it. And he says, you have my word. And he says, this past Friday night, you were planning to be with your wife. And three times you woke up to be with her, and then at the last minute you decided you're not going to do it. And he says, that's why it's coming to tell you, and he brings up the proof how it was. It was in an earthenware vessel, and it didn't light up properly. So anyways, the guy goes back to him, and he says, you're 100% right. That's exactly what happened this Friday night. Right? So we see over here, this, this, uh, this rabbi was spot on on all his interpretations that he, uh, you know, that he said. There was another one that's really interesting, is that there was a certain doctor by the name, and he gives the names also. If you look at it in his book, he gives names and locations of the people in, in the book so that he does, you don't think that he's making it up. There was a doctor by the name of Ezekiel Ezra. He was a son of Moses Al-Iri, right? I don't think that means any to, anything to anybody, but that's what he, he says. And he, this, this doctor was an ophthalmologist. And when he had a dream, he had a very odd dream, and he saw his father in a, in a dream. For the first time in 30 years, his father passed away 30 years ago, and he never saw him before in a dream, and he saw him now in a dream uh, for the first time. And in the dream, he said as follows. One line, he says, please, my son, if you could only accompany me to the city of Basra, if you could only do me this favor, I ask you for nothing more. And he woke up very confused because he hadn't seen his father 30 years ever in a dream. 30 years ago, he passed, passed away, and now today I see this. So he brings it up to the, to the rabbi, and uh, the rabbi interprets him as follows. He says, before he even interprets it, he says, first of all, let me explain to, explain to you about this father of this doctor. He says, I knew him. And uh, the, the rabbi said, he says, this, this, uh, this person that passed away 30 years ago, he was a very righteous person. He used to go... And he would go and, and uh, go around from, from in the synagogue, from place, from Minyan from, to Minyan, always answering Amen, always answering Kaddish, always doing that. And then afterwards, he would round up all the storekeepers, the people that were working, and he brings them to the synagogue, and he says, here, put on tefillin. He gave them talit and tefillin, and he said, here, put it on. And so much so is that he even bought extra for those people. And um, this was his, something that he was very particular about. So when he, when he uh, came to him in a dream, he says that... The, in, in two to three, no, sorry, in a, few, in a short while, somebody's going to come over to you. And he says, this person that's going to come over to you, he's going to need your help. And this, this uh, um, ophthalmologist, besides his specialty in the eyes, he also had a specialty in pr producing this certain type of uh, lotion that heals or helps uh, pain in the bones. It, it appears to me to like a, something like arthritis, right? Some, some sort of that type of pain. And um, he comes over and he says, this person, somebody's going to come over to you requesting for your help in one of these two things, either with the eyes or with the bones. And he says uh, that not long after he left this doctor, the, the, this rabbi also told him, he says, listen, when this happens, call for me because I want to see the wonders of the Lord. Right? I want to see how, how God works. And uh, he says it was, it was not a, you know, it was maybe a few hours and somebody came. And somebody came and he called the rabbi back and he says, listen, somebody came to, you know, to this doctor, exactly like you said. It was, a, it was a man about 30 years old. He had pain in his bones and he had no money. And the, the rabbi also told this doctor before, he said, listen, this is only going to go around for three days. And your, what your father came to you in a dream is telling you that this, this is a re reincarnation of your father and he's asking you to help him and don't charge him any money. Mm -hmm. He's not going to have any money. He came. And exactly that, a few hours later, exactly that had happened. This person came, 30 years old, whatever it was. He was very sick. He had pain in the bones, and he asked this doctor for help. The doctor went and helped him for a few, day, for a few days, before he, before, and then he passed away. But before he passed away, the rabbi went over to this poor person and says, listen, he says, maybe you got this because of certain sins that you did. Maybe you aren't by any chance being particular in tefillin. And he says, no, 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 chas v'shalom. He says, tefillin is one of the things that was very important, that I was very particular about. In fact, I made all my workers put on tefillin before they started working. And not only that, for Birkat Mazon, blessing before the, before, after the meal, he says, I was very particular that they go and bless even if it comes at my expense. And, he, and, this, and this poor person says, what could I do that, you know, due to my many sins, you know, people are eating the fruit of my labor. People are, are took away my business, took away everything, and I'm left with nothing. So this doctor, he, you know, worked on this uh, patient for a few days, and this patient passed away. And afterwards, the doctor felt really bad, and he also gave, donated money to his family. And uh, so this, this doctor, he thought for a second, he says, if my father was so holy, and my father did so many mitzvot, and this was his end, that he had to come back and be sick, and I had to go and heal him, he says, then what's my end going to be like? And he went, and he repented completely like he did, became a righteous person to the end of days. Oh, he wasn't religious. He was religious, but he became much more, uh, much more. Okay, and the lastly, the last story that he brings, um, no, actually two more stories that he brings down. 
is as follows. It says, well, one time there was, um, there was a very pious man that used to, used to fast a lot. He, uh, you know, and so, he fasted so much, you ever realize if, if, uh, if you don't eat for a, a long period of time, when you eat, you can't eat so much. You have to eat a little bit, and if you eat too much, you, your, your stomach starts hurting you. Right now, imagine some guy, somebody is fasting day in and day out, day after day, only eating at night for a little bit. Right? Eventually, his stomach shrinks, his stomach goes, and it's very painful for him to even eat. He said this person fasted for so long, he got to a certain point where he was in pain, and he just didn't want to eat anymore, and he even wanted to fast on Shabbat, which is not allowed. But due to his pain, he wanted to go speak to the rabbis about it and see if they could give him a, a permission to fast on Shabbat. So before he had a chance to speak to them, he had a dream. And in his dream, they brought him a platter of fruit and a platter of vegetables. And he says, here, why don't you eat? And he says, you know, in his dream, he thinks he's awake and he thinks that he's fasting. He says, I'm sorry, I can't, you know, I can't eat. So they told him in the dream, this man does not want in the resurrection of the dead. And then he woke up, and he was, you know, he was got really nervous. He said, what does that mean? He says, that, that, you know, he thought that that means that he's not getting resurrected at the, you know, for whatever reason. So he was very nervous. He ran into the rabbi, and he told the rabbi the dream. So the rabbi told him, he says, he says uh, um, you know, when a person eats something, right? You're eating sushi, you're eating a fruit, you're eating an apple. When you eat something, and you make a blessing over that, uh, that item, what happens is if there is a soul in that certain fruit, you're doing a tikkun for it, and you allowing it to raise it to the next level. Now, what happens if somebody, let's say, gets an apple and doesn't make a bacha, and there was a soul inside that apple that needed the tikkun, then what happens is that that soul now has to restart the whole process. It's very painful for the soul. And that's why God, the way that God works is that if a person has to go and has to come reincarnated back into food again, and, and this person, when he used to eat, he wouldn't make bachot, he would be reincarnated into an apple that would end up in a table in front of somebody who also didn't make a bachot. So just like what he did to somebody else is going to end up doing to him. So this is very important when somebody makes a bachot. So this rabbi tells him, he says, listen, you're fasting. You're fasting day in and day out. He says, but, but you're a righteous man. You don't need to fast. He says, you're not fasting for any sin. He says, you have to eat. By, by you eating and making bachot, you're raising the sparks, the souls that are stuck inside those fruits or vegetables or animals, whatever it is, to the next level. And that's why, he says, when they told you, they didn't say that you don't want the resurrection of the dead. They said that this person does not want the resurrection of the dead, which means you're preventing other people from getting their final tikkun. So he says, and he, and he brings it over here. Uh, this is the secret of the verse in uh, Devarim, in Deuteronomy. Chapter 8, verse 3, it says, Ki lo ala, ala adam. That a person does not live alone on just bread. But the mystical meaning of it is that a person that is reincarnated inside this fruit, he's not going to live alone, he's not going to live, uh, um, you know, beyond that without just, with, just being in the fruit. And then the pasuk goes on, Ki al kol pi Hashem, anything that comes out of a person's mouth, which is the word of God, which is the blessing, then Yichia Adam, the, the, the soul will live. So this is the pasuk that's the secret for it, for, the, for uh, releasing these sparks of souls that are stuck inside these uh, fruits. So this uh, um, person went on and, you know, started making, you know, making brachot and he started eating and obviously, you know, and, and all as well. There is, there is, uh, the last story is, was once a pregnant woman and this pregnant woman went over to the rabbi and she was very nervous about her dream. In her dream, she, uh, her, her husband's brother passed away some time ago. And in the dream, her husband goes into the grave, excavates her, her brother-in-law, which was died, right? So, which means he, he digs him out of the grave, swings him over the shoulder, and brings him to her home. And then he brings this, this dead brother up to the roof and he puts him down on the roof and he would not move him from off the roof. And the woman's like, you know, come and get him out of here. He's like, no, my brother's staying over here. So she was very nervous about it being the fact that she was pregnant. So she went over to the rabbi and the rabbi said, um, how many stairs do you have in your home? So going up to the roof. So she said, I don't know, maybe 12. So the rabbi said, are you sure it's not nine? And she's like, no, it's definitely not nine. Maybe 11, 12, 10, 11, 12. And he's like, are you 100% sure? He's like, not 100% sure, but I'm pretty sure that it's, that it's you know, 10, 11, or 12. So he says, listen, I'm not going to interpret the dream until you go home. Count the stairs and come back to me. So she comes back a short while later laughing. She's like, Rabbi, you're right. It was nine stairs. So the rabbi says, this is the interpretation of your dream. He says uh, that you're carrying right now, the, your deceased brother-in-law's soul is in your child. When, you're ba when the baby is going to be born, and it says that you're going to carry to term, that's the nine steps that you still went up the steps. So you're going to carry the term, you're not going to miscarry. And not only you're not going to miscarry, the baby is going, to, is going to be born well and he's going to live with you. Which means that's why she was stuck on the roof and he didn't want to remove him from the roof. And he says, uh, and, and additionally you should call him by the name after, the, after this brother-in-law. Uh, so, and exactly, that's what had happened. She had, the, she had a boy and she had a bleat and then she called him after the name and afterwards she went over back to the rabbi to thank him. Right? You, yeah, you know, your people are like thinking, you, know, you see a little baby, a little baby has been here before, you know? It could have been an old man, you know? It could have been your neighbor, for all you know. You know, it could be, so it's not, it's not always, you know, it's pure, it's a pure baby, but it could be that it has been here many times before.
Could be that it's here. Possible. Very unlikely, but possible. So, okay, so now, okay, so there is, uh, you know, there are people, let's say, usually see them. a very common dream is people see you flying. If you see yourself flying in a dream, right? Generally, flying or water is a thirst for spirituality, right? Generally, when you're flying up, you know, you're, you're going to, towards a spiritual or you're, you want more spiritual. And you have to, you know, you're, you're basically, your soul is telling you, come on, do more. You can do more. There is also in, in, important when you go to ask somebody to interpret a dream, you should go to a righteous person, right? Not only that, it should be a shomer abrit. Right? For example, Yosef, Yosef HaTzadik, if you look at the, in the parasha, what? Ben Porat Yosef, right? You know that the, the, there are certain you know, people, especially in the older generation, against evil eyes. Some people say, Bliyana'a, and then some people say, Ben Porat Yosef, right? Ben Porat Yosef, if you take the word Porat and you mix up the words, it's Potel, which means interpret dreams. Yosef was a dream interpreter. When you go to him, and what was Yosef? He was a big tzaddik and Shomel Abrit, very careful with, uh, with, uh, with any sins regarding the woman. So, there is a um, there is a gemara in brachot that says that here's first of all the, the most important line probably of the of this class is that dreams go after the interpretations, which means as if they have so this is why you should always interpret try to interpret a dream for the for the for the best. Now there was once there's a gemara in brachot that was once somebody who had a dream and he went over to 24 different dream interpreters. Right back in the day they used to have dream interpreters. It was like a business. Right that was like you know they put a slap a sign. Right and there were dream interpreters. Psychics. Right, psychics are fake though, but this is, was real. Yeah, but it's the like, same idea. Yeah, same idea. Same, uh, so so uh, he, went, he had one dream, he went over to 24 interpreters, and each one gave him a different interpretation. But the kicker was that each and every single one interpretation came true. Right, so everything came true. So the, the, the Gemara comes out of finalization is you, you, uh, the, the way that a person gets interpreted the dream, that's the way that's going to happen. That, we know the Pasuk in Genesis, uh, chapter 41, verse 13, is, it says, By Yosef, by Hikasha, Patar, Lanu, Kenaya. Just like he interpreted, that's how it came. Now, the, there is something very interesting. So you think about it. You're like, okay, what the, how does that work? Like, you know, if I, you know, if I have a dream, right, very good. So if I have a, a dream and somebody else is going to start telling me a story about my dream and that's how it's going to happen. How, so there's something very interesting that I want to bring you to from physics. Um, and whoever, you know, you, you have to really understand, have a little basic understanding of physics to understand this. But if not, I'll tell you what to look it up if you want to look it up. In 2002, there was a poll of uh, physics um, that the, the was the most beautiful experiment. Now, there is, in physics, it, there is something that, that ob they, they found out that observation affects the quantum uh, systems. Now, they did, an, uh, they did a, uh, a sort of experiment, which is called a double slit experiment, right? So if you want to look at it, you go search the double slit experiment, right? Or you could also do the most beautiful experiment in physics. Now, what they did was is they shot a single photon through a, uh, a plate that had two holes in it. So imagine you had a piece of paper here with two slits inside it. And they shot a photon through this, uh, through this plate. And on the, at the back end of it, they had, a, um, they had this plate, that, this photographic plate that records everything that passes by. Now, what they noticed, it says if somebody doesn't watch the photon going through, then it does something very interesting. It's sort of, um, the term that they use, it it's interferes with itself. So you have two slits, one photon, and it's sort of, that one photon goes through the two slits simultaneously at the same time. Now, if somebody goes and observes it, they re it just goes through one, which is very odd. They, they, saw, they found over here that by looking by just observation, you are able to change the way the photon interferes with itself and the way the photon goes into the photographic plate. And um, which what you see over here, by just by the fact, by obser observing something, it actually changes the reality. It actually changes the reality, right? So they give a whole different reasons uh, that, uh, that, um, that a photon, as, as well as other quantum systems, have, they don't have uh, th this location in space-time continuum is very different than uh, whatever. They give a whole, you know, look it up in that. That's not important. But the idea, the important part is, is that by observing, it changes, it, it acts differently when you look at it as when you don't look at it, which is crazy. Now, all the more so is when you speak, right? The power of words have such a strong impact. That's why the, um, you know, if, if you realize the word dibel or davar, you know, dibel is to speak in Hebrew. The word davar is a thing in Hebrew. Why? Because by speaking, you're creating, right? You know the famous thing, abracadabra? You know where that comes from? Ab Abracadabra comes from a, the Jewish, because the, a, a, you know, if, let's say you know, there are certain Kabbalists that they want to, they know practical Kabbalah, and they want to create something, they could create something with their mouth, with, through using certain names, of uh, you know, spiritual names. Abracadabra is really from the Hebrew, Avra, I will create, Keadabera, like I speak. I will create like I'll speak. And that's why you have all these magi magicians, abracadabra, right? Abracadabra has its source in, Kab in Kabbalistic uh, uh, literature, uh, quite well before magic became, you know, well, the fake magic became famous. So, 
the, the power of words are so strong that so much so, you know, if you say one line, it can ruin a friendship. If you can say one line, it can ruin a marriage. There are so many things that just the power of words have, so too in dreams. In dreams, it also has a, a very strong uh, power. Now, there was once a, a woman that went over to a rabbi, and she had a certain dream. And the rabbi interpreted her, don't worry, it means that you're going to have a baby boy. She's like, awesome, Bo Hashem, very good. She goes home happy, and lo and behold, she has a baby boy. Not, you know, whatever, 10 months later. And then a few, like some time goes by, she has the same dream again. She goes to the rabbi, the rabbi says, don't worry about it, you're going to have a baby boy. And she's like, awesome, listening home. Again, a short while later, she has a baby boy. Then she came back a third time with the same dream. She goes over to the rabbi, and she, she sees the rabbi's not there. So he asks one of the students, where's the rabbi? She says, oh, the rabbi had to leave. Says, Can we help you with anything? So she said, I had a certain dream that, you know, and she told them the dream, and they interpreted it really bad. And she's like, what are you doing? What are you crazy? He's like, the rabbi told me I was going to, you know, the dream is supposed to be for a baby boy. And they're like, listen, this is the dream interpretation. When, they, when the rabbi came back and he found out, you know, it was a very bad dream interpretation, like someone's going to die. So uh, um, she said, uh, when the rabbi came back and the students told him about it, they said, you killed this person. He says, why, why are you giving her a bad interpretation? So a person has to be very careful when interpreting. The interpretation has to go for the best, if it's possible. Which we'll soon see some dreams are, you know, it's very difficult to interpret for the best. Like we spoke about last time, a tooth falling out. It's not, a good, it's not really a good dream. So there is, uh, there's another Gemara in Bachot, page 56. There was a very interesting, famous dream interpreter by the name of Barhedya. Barhedya would had a very interesting policy, which many people have nowadays. If you pay him, he'll interpret it favorably. If you don't pay him, he's going to interpret it bad. So there's two rabbis that came to him with very similar dreams. For the one that paid him, he gave a good interpretation. For the one that didn't pay him, he gave a bad interpretation. And uh, uh, so I'll, I'll actually go through, and you can learn a little bit about what the interpretations are by the, by the dreams. He told him the dream, and he told him back the interpretation. I'll go through a few of them. So the rabbi said, this is the rabbi that didn't pay him. He says, I saw the outer door of the house fall. So the interpretation of his Baal Hedya told him was, your wife is going to die. Then Rav said he says he saw his molars and his other teeth fall out. So Baal Hedya, the interpreter, uh, interpreted and says, your sons and daughters will die. Your son and daughter will die. Rav said he said, I saw two doves flying. So Baal Hedya said, you will divorce two wives. And, uh, you know, so then he says, uh, then Rava realized, he says, he heard that, you know, he accepts money. He didn't even know that he had to pay him. So he goes, he, and he paid him. He paid him and says, oh, I had some more dreams. Here's some money. And I listened to how he switched everything. The, uh, you know, Rava now told him some dreams. Dreams that sounded bad, and he interpreted for the best. Rava said, he says, uh, this is after he paid him. He says, I saw a wall fall. So he says, Baha'i says, you'll buy property without limit. Then he, saw, he says, I saw my house fall down, and everybody came and took one brick and left. So he says, this means that your teaching will spread out through the entire world. And he goes through a bunch of them. You go look at the Gemara over there. There's, uh, there's plenty of, uh, you know, one after another of uh, dream interpretations that he says. When he paid him, good interpretation. When he didn't pay him, you're going to die, and this is going to bad, it's going to happen, you're going to lose this, you're going to lose everything. So one day, this, uh, this rabbi, Rava, was on a boat, and this interpreter was also on a boat. And as this interpreter was going off, a little black book fell out of his pocket. So the rabbi went up to pick it up to give it to him, and he opens up this book, and he sees that it says over there, all interpretations go after the mouth. And this rabbi is saying, this guy, his wife died. His children, you know, things that he, that he interpreted happened. And he goes over to this interpreter and he says, you know, Rasha, wicked one. He says, for everything I forgive you, except for the death of my wife. He says, that I'm not going to forgive you. And, you know, this interpreter was like, now he was like put in a pickle. He's like, listen, he says, uh, you know, a curse of a rabbi, even if it's not justified, is very powerful. But this is certainly justified. So he decided that this interpreter is going to go and put himself in exile. And he put himself in exile. And then uh, he was sitting next to somebody who guards the king's, uh, um, you know, treasure. And the person asked him, he said, listen, I heard your interpreter. I had a dream. I had a dream that a needle went through my uh, finger. So he says, pay me and I'll interpret it for you. And the guy says, I'm not paying you. So it's fine. Don't pay me. Then he says, I had another dream a short while later. It says that a worm fell through my fingers. So the this interpreter said, pay me and I'll tell you. He's like, oh, no, I'm not going to pay you anything. Then he finally said a third dream. He says, I had a dream that a worm fell on my hand. And uh, this, uh, the interpreter said it means that all this, the, the, basically the king's silk got ruined. And they found out that the king's silk got ruined, and like all of it got ruined. So they went and they, wanted, they went to kill this uh, guard of, this, this, of, the, of the treasure. Um, so they went, this, went to this guard and said, listen, why are you killing me? Kill the guy that knew about it all along. He didn't want to interpret my dreams. He said, what, am I, what do you want from me? So they went and they, they, they found this dream interpreter, and they found out that it was true. And this is what they did to this dream interpreter. They took, him, they took two big trees, and they bent it in. Then they tied one arm to one tree, one arm to another tree, one leg to one tree, one leg to another tree, and then they let go of the tree. And the tree sprang back, and he was split in half. And uh, you know, there's rabbis that explain, he says why this was exactly his punishment. He says he separated the rabbi with his wife, with his bad, you know, his wife, this rabbi's wife died. He, uh, so he, just like a person is, and his wife is one, he says, and he split them two, then his one also became split into two. 
So this is very interesting that, you know, how does this work? You know, this person interprets and that's the way it's going to happen. So there was once a rabbi by the name of the Rabbi Yaakov Mitush. He lived about a thousand years ago, one of the Baalei Tosfos. And he asked in a dream. There's a certain way which we're not going to speak about that you could ask a question in heaven in a dream. Right? There's a certain thing that you do have to do certain things. You have to write a, your question, you put it on the pillow and whatever, and you get a dream in the night. So uh, he asked this question in the dream, why is it, how is it possible that somebody who goes and, and interprets everything that comes true? It doesn't make any sense. So they answered him, Gzerahi. Gzerahi means this is a decree. It's a decree from heaven that this is how it should happen. So he wasn't happy with the answer. He asked again in the dream. And again, they answered him, this is a decree and this is how it should happen. Again, he wasn't satisfied. He did it a third time. The third time they told him, third time he really wanted to ask. His, his question was, how is it possible it's Balhedya? Balhedya was a non-Jew. How does this non-Jew have so much power that he's able to interpret all the dreams and it'll come true? So they told him in the dream, he says, there are certain people that have stronger mazal, stronger luck in certain things. He says Balhedya was one of those type of people that his mazal was with dreams. He would be able to interpret dreams, you know, very accurately. Okay, so, so Ben Ishchai also says, says could, could, does this make sense? Could it be that somebody could go and interpret something that they didn't want in heaven to happen? Right, the obvious question that it goes is, if this is supposed to happen in heaven, what's going to difference how somebody's going to interpret it? So rather, it says that uh, um, the, the HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the God puts the interpretation in the person's mind the way that it's supposed to happen. Which means the person's not really changing anything that happens, but God, the, the thing that's supposed to happen is going to happen anyway. Which means is don't leave your faith to some dream interpreter that's going to, everything is going to be okay for everything. Okay, so uh, moving forward, there is a, um, there is, it's very important that a person should always interpret everything for the, for the good. Even if it doesn't look so good, you should try to interpret it for the good. There is, uh, there was once a, a person also has to realize when he looks at certain things, he, everything has to be, has to be looking in a good eye. There was once somebody who went over to a rabbi, um, and this was Rabbi Eliashev in Israel. He went over to this rabbi furious. One morning, one morning he, he burges in, he says, listen, rabbi, today is my son's brit milah. I'm not going in. I'm not going to my brit. So rabbi says, listen, calm down. He says, what's going on? Well, what happened? So he says his father passed away. This person's father passed away not too long ago. And his father's name was Jonathan. And they wanted to name the baby Jonathan after the father. And the wife was very nervous because there was a neighbor in the same building who had a child by the name of Jonathan. And the child died when it was five years old. He got into a very, uh, you know, the, the car basically hit him. And he passed away. She said, listen, I don't want to name him after, you know, look, the same name as a child, you know, it's, it's not good luck, she said. So, you know, so he got, and they got into a very serious argument over it. And they told him, he goes over to the rabbi and says, listen, rabbi, he says, I'm not going to, this, to, to my son's brit unless if you tell my wife that everything's going to be okay, that if she could name the son Yonatan, then we'll, we'll be able to continue with the brit. So the rabbi tells him, he says, there's one thing that you can not do. And that is, you cannot name this child Yonatan. And he's like, what? he's like, what do you mean you can't name him Yonatan? He's like, we well, can name him whatever you want, do not name him Yonatan. So he says to the rabbi, what, what's the reason? Why can't I name him Yonatan? Or what's the big problem? And he says, that I can't tell you right now. He says, the only thing I can tell you is don't name him after that name. So he was very, you know, very troubled by it, but he leaves. You know, the, this righteous man, the righteous, most righteous man in the gener generation tells him something, say, you listen. So he goes to his Brit Milan and they name him something else. And he spoke about you know, this to a few close friends and says, I, you know, what was the reason? Why can't I name him Yonatan? So each, each friend gave him a different reason. Oh, because Shalom Bayit. You know, Rabbi didn't want you to get fights with your, with your wife. And uh, the other one said, no, it's, a bad, it's really bad luck. And then this one says, no, oh, forget about the bad luck. Forget about the bad, you know, bad wife. If a name is not joined together with a husband and wife, it's obviously not good. Everyone is bringing their own interpretation. Finally, after a few months passed by, and it kept on bothering the father. He says, why did the rabbi tell me that? And he goes over back to the rabbi and says, Rabbi, you know, I know you told me you didn't want to tell me a few months ago, but please, can, can you share with me what's the reason that you, that you said this? And the rabbi said, he says uh, as follows, and it's amazing how rabbis think. He says, when you came into this, to my, to my, you know, to my room and asked me this question, he says, I didn't think about you. I did not think about your wife. I didn't even think about the baby. The only one person that I thought about was the mother of a little child by the name of Yonatan. He says, how do you think she's going to feel in two years down the line, or three years down the line, where your child is playing outside and the wife and the mother is calling, Yonatan, come in. And this mother is seeing, is like, oh my God, I had a Yonatan. My Yonatan can't come in anymore. He says, you know how hurt that she would be? I wasn't thinking about any of you. I was thinking about her. Right? And that's why I told you, whatever you do, you cannot name it after Yonatan. This is how a rabbi thinks. This is how a righteous person thinks. Thinks outside of the box and looks at the most important thing. When someone comes into you and says, I have this bad dream that I had, there's obviously a, someone's opening up to you, something that's bothering them. Now, you shouldn't be like, oh, whatever, it's nothing, don't worry about it, right? You should go and, you know, you have to, you, you, have to, you know, associate with them and, and really help them out. And leaving from that place wasn't an option. Then you didn't even know what I was going to say. Before the Brit Milah, everyone pack up and move. <laughs> Let's, uh... 
Moving is very difficult. It's easier to name a kid a different name than move. So, okay. Now, I want to um, you know, explain also that there is uh, interpreting a dream, even though we're going to soon speak about certain interpretation. Interpreting a dream is not just so blatantly like, simple, like I, I'm going to give you a list of interpretations that everything plugs in. And the proof is we're going to go look at Yosef HaSadiq's, uh, how he interpreted. There was uh, one, of, and we'll go through both of his dreams very briefly. I won't, be, I won't uh, stick in a long time, even though you could really speak in it for, for quite some time just on those two dreams. The dreams that I'm referring to are the dreams of the baker and the winemaker. Now, what was the dream of the baker? The dream of the baker was that he had three baskets on his head, right? One after another. And the top, he had baked goods of the, of, of the, of the, of Paro, of the king. And there was birds that were coming, and they were eating off the top of his, of the, of the top layer, whatever it was. So the dream interpreter was, the dream interpretation was, it says that in three days, you're going to get hung. You're going to get killed, right? So how did Yosef know that? So the Dubna Magad explains it in a parable. It says one time there was a king. And this king, he wanted to um, paint, he was building an you know, extension to his palace, and he wanted to paint this ma magnificent picture that no one had ever seen before. So he hired the best painter in the world to come. He brought him in, and he said, listen, whatever you want, you'll get. Right? Any price you want, I want you to make the most realistic painting possible. So the painting said, fine, and he worked on it for months, <laughs> months, months. He's working on this huge, life-size, uh, uh, real painting. Uh, and after many, many months of working on it, the king looks at it, it looks magnificent. He says it was so real, it was, it was a person holding a platter of fruit. And it was so real that when people walked into the room, they started talking to the painting, thinking that it was real. It was, ex it was extremely, extremely vivid with clarity and everything. The colors, everything was perfect. And the king said, you did an amazing job, and you're going to get duly rewarded for it. However, I'm going to offer you a bonus. It says, if I'm going to bring a panel of judges, if any one of them can find you know, something wrong with the painting, they get, something that they get uh, certain money, and you get it deducted from your bonus. What I told you you're going to pay, you're going to get. But they're going to get uh, something. If they can't find anything, you're going to get the full bonus. So the guy said, fine. So they bring him a panel of judges, and it was open to the public. Anybody who would come, want to come to try to find the full one could come. And people, the judges were sitting there, wise men, very, you know, with the wisdom of art, and they could not find a single thing. It was so real that the, it was brought outside, and the birds were coming, and they were trying to actually eat the fruit off this, off this platter. So everybody was like mesmerized by this. Like I've never seen such a beautiful painting in my life before. And he was about to, the king was about to close up off the shop and give all the bonus to this uh, to this painter. And then there was one wise old man that comes in and he says, uh, he says, listen, he says something's off over here. So everyone's quiet. Everyone's listening to this man. He says, what, what possibly can you see off over here? He says, the fact that birds are coming and they're eating from the fruit platter, that means that that person is not real for them. Because if that person would be real for them, they'll be scared. A bird doesn't just come and eat off, off, your, off your plate. It must be that in the bird's eyes, that person does not look that real. He says, if that person doesn't look that real, it means it's not, not such a realistic picture. The king was like, excellent. Hey, he gave him a small thing, and then you know, they went on the way. He says in the dream, what happened in the dream? There were birds that were eating, eating from the top of the baker's uh, thing, the top of the baker's head. He says, how are they eating it? Birds will be scared. They're not going to come eat something out of your hand. Must be if they're eating, must be you're not alive anymore. If you're not alive anymore, Therefore, that's, your, uh, that's the interpretation. The interpretation is that you're going to die in three days. Now look, the other dream, interp the other dream that he had in that area, in the, in the, in the prison, was the uh, winemaker. The winemaker had a very interesting dream. In his dream, he had, he had, uh, he had uh, this vine. And this vine, there was, you know, he saw the budding, and then the, vine, and then the grapes ripened up, and he took the grapes, he squeezed it into the Powell's cup. Right? So Joseph interpreted that in three days' time, you're going to be reinstituted to the, to the king, back to, the, to your old, uh, sta uh, you know, wherever your, your, your position. So how did he figure it out? He says, first of all, there's three levels of uh, the way that grapes, gra grapes mature is three levels. There is the budding, then there's the immature grapes, and then there's mature grapes. Now, he saw three vines. Now, in the vines, he said, okay, these three vines signify time. Now, how do I know how much time is it? Is it three days, three months, three years, three weeks? How do I know how much time it is? So then he looked at the at the fact of the budding of the grapes. The grapes went from budding to mature grapes in one instant, which means is that the level of time has to be very quick, very close together. So therefore, the time must be three days, not three months or three years. Then he put, plugged it all together, then in three days' time, the king is having a birthday. He put it all together, and he came with an interpretation. The, poor, the purpose that I'm telling you this is that when you have a dream interpretation, you have to take everything into consideration, everything into the factor. The factor is, well, the dream, all the details of the dream, the, the personality of the person, what the person has been going through, what are the issues of the person. You take all that, and then you have to paint a picture from, from, that, uh, um, from, the, from the information that you have. There, there's a question is that, that, that is asked, can a person interpret the dream for themselves, right? Hopefully after this, the final class, if you also if you review the three classes, you should have very, very solid understanding on dreams. Now, you can say, listen, I consider myself a uh, dream expert. 
I'll interpret all my dreams for myself. So the question is, can you interpret the dreams for yourself, or do you have to go to somebody else and have somebody else interpret it? So there's actually a machloket. Ritva says, yes, you can interpret it for yourself. And the proof that he gives is from the Gemara, Shmuel. Shmuel said in the Gemara, he said, for bad dreams, he says, which means is they mean nothing. For the good dreams, he said, oh, which means is, uh, yeah, the good dreams mean everything. So he, he interpreted himself. For the bad dreams, he said, means nothing. For the good dreams, he interpreted for the good. So here is a proof that you could interpret it yourself. How oh, Shlomo al Moli says, no, you have to get others to interpret it for you. And the Zohar says also that if somebody interprets it, it should interpret it out loud. Okay, and likewise, we said before, just an example of, um, if let's say somebody sees a horse, and the horse is can you know he sees he, let's put, let's paint the picture that he sees a, a horse he's a person riding on a horse and with great difficulty he crosses a stream so what does that mean so a horse re usually represents um, it, it depends first of all on the person if let's say somebody who is wise it, it's it's going to be a different interpretation than somebody who is strong so a horse running through a stream if the person is wise that means is that he's going to come through some sort of difficulty through his wisdom he will be able to to go through it which means and, and cross this other side. If it's somebody who's really strong, it's, the interpretation is slightly different. The interpretation is, is that this person is going to come through some obstacle, and through his strength, he'll be able to overcome it. So again, you have to take into, into uh, the fact of what the person is going through, what, the per what type of person that person is. Now, there's a very, another interesting uh, um, machloket, which if you have a dream, and you don't go to interpret it, and you don't go to interpret it, you don't go to five, figure it out, you just ignore it. What does it mean? Does that dream going to come true, or is it, or is it, uh, or is it you know, not going to come true because you didn't interpret it. Because we said the dreams go after the interpretation. You follow me? So was someone still with me? All right. So the, the, it's actually, it's also machoka, but the Gemara says if you don't open, if you don't, if, sorry, if you don't interpret a dream, it's like an unopened letter, which means it's not going to happen. The, the Zohar says, the Kabbalistic says, it says, no, what does that mean? It says, what do you mean? If somebody lets you send you a letter in the mail, and the letter says, listen, uh, take your money out of this stock, it's going to flop, right? And the guy says, he sees the letter, and he's like, I don't want to open it. Uh, it doesn't look good. The, the, and let's say this guy's an expert, and the money in the stock flopped. You know, the, the, the money, or he lost it all. He says, why don't you tell me? He says, I told you. He says, no, but I didn't open the letter. He's like, what, who cares? The, the letter is there. Same thing with dreams. It comes to you in a dream because you're not going to interpret it. It's not going to come true. He says, no, it's going to come true. You're just not going to know about it. Okay, so now... Um, which one is it? It's going to come true? It's a machloket. It's a It depends on the Gemara or the Zohar. The Gemara says it's you know, a dream that it's not interpreted. It's like an unopened letter. The Zohar says regardless, it's going to come true. You're just who not... Follow? follow whoever... The Gemara is usually who we follow. The Gemara is usually follow it for halakha, not the, not the Kabbalistic verses. But it's always better if you find somebody that really knows how to, how to help you with a dream, then even if it's a bad dream, they can interpret it for the good. Right, so that's always uh, um, it's also true that dreams on Shabbat are not true. Dreams on Shabbat are even more true. They're, they're, yeah, the stronger. And also, is it true that dreams are the opposite? A lot of yeah, we're gonna soon see that a lot of things that you think are that, that are that look bad or are very big sins in a dream. It's a it's a it's a great it's a great sign. So yeah, it's it's very yeah. You will soon see that. So, but not everything is opposite. It's not like a mirror wall. Um, okay, now. The, that being said, it says that a person always has to find the, the, the good way to interpret it. I'm going to read you a Gemara from, the, from in Bava Kama, page 55a. This is how something looks so bad, and the interpreter interpreted it for the best. There was once somebody, a rabbi, that went over and it says that um, he said he saw his jaws fall out. So the other rabbi says, don't worry about it. It means that two Roman legions were plotting against you, and they died. Then he said, said another bad dream. He says, I saw his nose, his nose fall off. And he says, oh, don't worry. It says, no anger comes from the nose. He says, the anger that was against you went away. Then he says, I saw his two hands fall off. In the dream, he saw the two hands fall off. He says, no, don't worry about it. It's all good. He says, this means that you don't need the labor of your hands. You'll be wealthy. Then he says, you know, another, another dream, he saw his legs cut off. And he says, don't worry about it. You will now ride on a horse. Right? So everything that looked bad, he turned for the good. There is a... Uh, um... All right. So now let's... let's uh, any questions thus far? No. How should you go yeah. to the A big rabbi. Oh. Yeah. If you need, I mean, listen, every time you dream, don't be on speed, don't be on speed. If you know what you're talking, yeah, if you, there's, so there's a, a, a good book, is Rabbi Shlomo Amoli's Dream Interpretation. He has a, it's in English, it's written about 500 years ago, so I don't know how long ago it was translated. In the back, which we're going to speak about a lot of these, you'll see like 30 or 40 pages on Dream Interpretation, what each thing means. What uh, uh, it's written, I don't remember what it's called, it's, uh, his, his name is Rabbi Shlomo Amoli. And uh, I could find it afterwards, and I could I could look it up, and I could actually show you the actual name of the book. I, maybe the dream interpretation. When did he live? About five hundred years ago, four hundred years ago. So he's like, um, like Amari, like like all the rabbis Amari. Uh, no, 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 that, that's right. That's the Gemara. 
So he's, but he's after that. He was like in the time of the Ariza, in that, uh, in that time period. I don't remember exactly the, the date that he was in. But yeah, he has had, there's also another one. Um, Rav, some, Rav Sharabi right, has, a, has a certain sefer on prayers, but that's only in Hebrew. And in that, he has about 100 interpretations. Where do they get these interpretations? Well, there's Gemara, there's Kabbalah, there's Rav Haigon, has also a lot of interpretations. So we're going to go through a bunch of interpretations now. So uh, like I said earlier, though, from now till the end, try no questions, and we'll ask questions at the end, because, no, 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 not, I, you are good. No, that, from now, like starting now. <laughs> yeah. so, uh, so that's why I want to get all the questions out of the way beforehand. Because now I'm going to go through all the, all the things, and I'm, I'm literally going to be reading it from here. Some of the things, I'm going to explain the reason behind it. Most of them I will not. Right? And afterwards, if you want, we'll try to uh, um, you know, answer as much as, as we can at the end. Bezat Hashem. Okay, so the way that it's going to work is as follows. I'm going to say something. If you see this in a dream, and this is going to be the interpretation. Then we're going to move on to the next one. If you see yourself in the land of Israel in a dream, it means that God will lead you there. If you see yourself in Jerusalem... It means that God will give you a post of authority. If you see yourself in Ethiopia, you will find yourself in great trouble. If you see yourself in Egypt, you will receive great good. If you see yourself digging, so now if you're with a healthy body, you have nothing to be concerned. If you see yourself digging while you're ill, it's a bad sign. If you see yourself carrying earth, it's a bad sign. This is a a hint of uh, burial. If you see yourself moving from one city to another, you will travel long distance. If you see yourself at home or in your city, you'll be saved from trouble. If you see a well-decorated house, it foretells happiness and tranquility. If you see a wall in your house fall, death and trouble are near. And this is one of the reasons that we said if you have a pillar in your house, it's one of the things that people actually fast for. If you see yourself going up a roof, you will, or it's also a roof or a mountain, you will rise to greatness. If you see yourself descending from a roof, you will lose your greatness. If you see the beams of your house fall, a child will die. If you see the ceiling will fall, your wife will die. If you see yourself in a high place, you will attain friendship of high. If you see yourself looking from a high place, it signifies a long life. If you see yourself ascending to a high place, it's a good sign for you and your children. The general rule is that, you know, going up is generally a good sign. As opposed to going down is generally not the good, not not the best sign. Doesn't mean that it's bad, not the best sign. If you see yourself going up a ladder, again, going up, it's a good sign. If you see yourself getting arrested by an officer, right, and you're put in metal chains, it's a good sign. Right? It's a good sign and it's it, because it's, uh, you're protected from running away. Right? So, so too you're protected from harm. If you see a well in a dream, it's, uh, the Gemara says that you will see peace. If you are standing in the rain, it's also a good sign. If you're bathing in the sea, it also signifies uh, tranquility, peace. If you see yourself drowning in the sea, it signifies illness or loss of money. If you see yourself drinking water in your dream, it's a good sign. Okay, I'm skipping a lot because we won't have time. But if anybody has particular questions, we could go through them afterwards. If you see yourself falling into fire, it's not a good sign. It means that you're aband- you will abandon God's will, and this is your descendant to the fires of uh, Gehenom. If you see your house on fire, it's involved a dispute. Isn't it? Love it. If you see a ring on one of your fingers, except for the pinky, you'll be an object of suspicion. Right. Very apropos, I guess, for, for girls. Yeah. If you see yourself, if you see yourself finding silver or gold, you will be honored. If you see yourself worshiping a silver or gold idol, the, you will come to a situation in which you are hated. If you see yourself eating melons, sickness will fall you. Eating peas or beans, your circumstance will improve. Horseradish, you will have a good life. Wheat, your circumstance will improve. It also foretells an increase of money, silver and gold. If you see cabbage, it's a good sign, and wealth will come to you. Turnips is only a good sign if they are attached. They are a bad sign if they are detached from the ground. Grass is also good. You'll find sustenance. Cucumbers is not good. Illness will be for you. Garlic is also not good. I want to get to a certain part, so I'm going to try to skim through this. If you see yourself climb a tree, honor will come your way. If you see trees falling, your children will die. If you see yourself sleeping under a tree, God will help you. Others say that you'll have children. If you see a broken beam, like we said before, it's a bad sign. If you see yourself eating nuts, it's also a good sign. If you see an etrog, it means that you're honored by, you're, you, you will be honored by God. It's just a good sign. Olives is generally also a good sign. Lemon is a bad sign. This means you'll become poor. Raisins means it's a good sign. And one of the reasons is also is because uh, grapes, they could rot. But raisins, they last a long time because they're already past that stage. So that is a good sign. Oh, here. If you see yourself drunk. 
So now we're going to be going through, a, you know, throughout this thing, we're going to be go speaking about things like we spoke about earlier that says that it seems really bad, but in essence, it's a good, uh, it's, it's a good sign. If you see yourself drunk, you will have great trouble, but be safe from it. If you see a drunk, your situation will improve. Right? And I'm not saying this to hang around drunks now so you could drink that, because that doesn't count. <laughs> right? By the way, all these things that we're saying now are only the real dreams. We spoke about in, in, uh, in the second uh, lecture, the second shiul of dreams is how to tell between a real dream and a fake dream. And again, always, you always good to refer back to that. You can find it on Torah anytime to, uh, um, to review. And then this will help you to figure out what the dreams mean. If you see any type of intoxicating beverages is a good sign. You'll have property and wealth. Right? But obviously, let's say somebody works in this business. He works in the, you know, selling wine, all these things. So obviously, that, that, that comes to effect. Is it a real dream or not? Because it's something that he's been thinking about all day. If you've been thinking about it all day, it's not a, it doesn't mean anything. Generally, seeing ships is a good sign, a sign for rulership. Animals. Let's speak some animals. If you see an ox or a sheep, it's a good sign. If you see cows, it's, you'll see the downfall of your enemies. If you see a camel, in heaven, he was decreed that death should come to that person, but he's been saved from it. If you see groups of animal, anim, uh, camels, is a bad sign. Pigs is also for something very interesting. If you see a pig, good earnings are prepared for you. If you see yourself eating a pig's meat, you will add wealth to your wealth, which is a very good sign. And again, you're not allowed to eat pig, just for everyone knows. But in the dream, if you eat it, it's a good sign. And if you see yourself riding a pig, you'll be protected from your enemy and you eat its meat, it's a good sign. Right? <laughs> so it's, it's, it's a, um, these are good signs. If you see a donkey, it's also a very good sign. If you see yourself falling from the donkey, it's a bad sign for poverty. All horses that you see in a dream are good, except for red ones. Now, obviously, this is not talking about little girls that, you know, if they, oh, they fantasize about having a pony and things like that, and they dream about riding a unicorn, that doesn't really mean anything. But I'm talking about somebody who hasn't <laughs> thought about any, anything regarding uh, horses, and they dream about a horse. It's a good sign. Unless it's red, we said. If you see yourself riding a horse, greatness will be yours. Okay, mule is not a good sign. Mule, if, somebody, if you see yourself riding a mule, poverty will come, will befall you. If you see somebody falling off a mule, it's also not a good time. You see yourself falling off a mule. If you see a lion, okay. If you're struggling with a lion and you win, you will win over your enemies. If a lion chases you, your enemies lie in wait and seek you. If you see a beer attacking you, it signifies a dispute. If you see a beer's head in your hand, you will obtain illegal wealth. Beer? A beer, yeah. A snake. Snake is actually a very good sign. If you see a snake in your dreams, it's a sign for uh, panasa, money. If, yeah, if the snake bites you, it's doubled. It's even more so. Now. It's good. If a snake bites you, it's even better. Yeah. Right? Now, of course, it's not... Yeah. Can I ask a side question? Yeah. Is it, is it okay for someone to have a snake as a pet? Like, or is that bad? Generally, <laughs> it's a very strong side question. Um, I don't know why anybody would like to have a snake, uh, but, <laughs> but halakhically, is it a problem? You're not allowed, you shouldn't just do any, you know, prayers or blessings and things next to it, but uh, generally, halakhically, it's not. It's like some people ask about a dog. Are you allowed to have a dog? Right? Um, halakhically, you're allowed to have a dog. Kabbalistically, it's not so good. So kabbalistically, is it not so good? To a snake, I, I have to look. I'm, I'm not familiar specifically about the snake. I mean, the snake is the nachash, which is, uh, you know, so that might say anything about that. But I know some people have this weird thing, and they like snakes. I especially like to see them eat small mice and other <laughs> creatures. Right? So uh, um, I had a neighbor when I was growing up that used to have a snake. And we used to go, he used to walk around with a snake wrapped up in his hand throughout the street. Right? And all the little kids would be like, what? My uncle had one. Right. There are people. Yeah, there, People have interesting hobbies. So, um, whatever it is, halakhically, it's, not, it, it, it's very different than Kabbalistically. Okay, now if you see a snake on your lap, but if let's say that person dreams about snake, it's very different because uh, um, it doesn't mean as, you know, as much as it would be for um, somebody else. If you see a snake on your lap, your sustenance is assured. If you see a snake in water, it's actually not a good sign. Only if you're, if you're not married, then, you'll have, um, then you will marry. However, if you have a wife, then you'll be widowed. You see a snake? In water. Yeah. If you snake see, in water. Snake in water. If you, yeah. If you see yourself killing a snake, it's a good sign. Ooh. Elephants. If you see an elephant, miracles will be performed for you. Right? Plaim. Pila and plaim, also very similar. Now, if the... Okay, we have to hurry up a little bit. Okay, so let me skip a few things. Dogs. This is a... Oh, first a cat. If... I don't, this is a very interesting one. If you see a cat, you'll merit stylish clothing. Right? So I guess it's good for more women than men that doesn't care that much. But yeah, so cats are a good, uh, a good sign, I guess. Um, dogs. This is, a, this is what I get asked a lot. Dogs. If you see dogs running, you are the subject of gossip. If you see yourself playing with dogs, your enemies will love you. If you see dogs barking before you, your enemy's plan will succeed. If you see dogs barking behind you, your enemies lie in wait for you. If you see dogs chasing you, it signifies uh, governmental extortion, so trying to take out the, um, you know, by force money or, or other something through threats. If you see the dog has bitten you, 
your enemies will prevail against you. Absolutely. If you see yourself eating a dog meat, you'll move from place to place. If you see yourself killing a dog, your enemy has been moved elsewhere. A mouse, this is also I've gotten recently, if you see a mouse in a dream. If you see a mouse in a dream, it means that you'll meet someone new. And this is not like the horoscope, like today you'll meet someone new. Yeah, no. I don't know. Doesn't necessarily mean, doesn't necessarily mean a husband. Someone new, what? You meet someone new every day. Or like... You see new people, you don't meet new people. Okay. Sometimes you, I mean, depends how friendly you are. You know, there's some people <laughs> that really do meet new people every day. Yeah. Um, if you see yourself riding a deer, you have, it's not a good sign. You have committed a sin which angers God. Birds. And the Gemara says all types of birds are good sign except in a dream, except for an owl, a horned owl, and a bat. Yeah, where there's a lot about birds, we're going to skip that. Ostrich. If you see yourself pursuing, running after an ostrich, but do not catch up to it, you'll pursue wealth and not attain it. So you'll try to become wealthy and you won't make it. If you see yourself riding an ostrich, you will attain greatness. It's a good sign. Also something you should not try. Riding enough? Riding? Yeah, but not, not to try when you're awake. This is when, in, when you're sleeping. When you're sleeping. I wish everybody had to respond. Oh, let's call that. Thank you. If you see bees in your dreams, your enemies will attack you. If you see flies, it pretends robbery. If you see a hawk, if you're capturing a hawk, good things and honor will come to you. Hunting an eagle, you'll become wealthy. All right. If you see yourself catching fish with a hook or a net, God will give you a good life. If you see milk, that's a good sign. Uh, wealth and greatness will be yours, and also your mazal will be, be, will be improved. If all eggs are a good sign except ostrich eggs. I don't think anybody knows how an ostrich egg looks, but if you do and you have a dream about that, I would hope so. Yeah. Um, if, you see, if you eat hard-boiled eggs or scrambled eggs, you'll know that your prayer has been, has been expect, uh, accepted. By the way, I'm, I'm reading you about maybe 10% of what I have over here. I'm just picking up things that I would think people might see. If you see yourself eating blood, and this is actually came to me as a question, that's a, a good sign you'll be saved from trouble. Again, luckily you're not allowed to eat blood. Right? What was scrambled eggs and hard-boiled eggs? It your, means that your prayer have been accepted. It's a good sign. If you see river, a bird, or a pot, it portends to peace. If you see yourself eating human flesh, not that good of a sign. You'll hate a friend. Okay, this is for a man, this is also for a man, let's skip that. We're going to skip some of the bad stuff. Okay, if you see yourself die in a dream, it's actually a very good sign. Many people are very nervous, they see yourself die, if you die in a dream, it's a sign that you will live a long life. So it's actually a good sign to die in a dream. If you have pain in your eye in the dream, it's not a good sign. If you remove your bowels in the dream, it's a good sign. If, I guess this is more, also, woman might dream about this more, but if, let's say, you have a fingernail that's torn or bad looking, it's a sign of wisdom. But again, not, that's not being that, let's say, you just went and done your nails, and then you're very obsessive about it, that it doesn't break, or whatever it is, and then you dream about it, it doesn't really mean anything, because again, that's something that you've been thinking about. If you see yourself get taller, right, not talking about wearing heels, it, your height actually increases, you will live many years. Good sign. If you see yourself washing your head, you'll be saved from every trouble. If you see yourself running in a dream, it's also a good sign. Right, and many people get this, uh, get this dream, and I, to be honest, I can't, uh, you know, all I can tell you is about that running, that they try to run, but they're not moving, right? They're just, if you see yourself running in the dream, it's a good sign. Is that the same yes, thing as running? Running? running in general is a good one, I mean. Running without your people. Yeah. And you're being chased. All right, so I, well, let's talk about that at the end. We'll talk about all those, uh, yeah, those at the end. This is the, the general one that I have all, this is all sourced. All of these that I'm telling you is a, a source. I'm not making up anything. That's why you see me reading directly from the paper. I'm not actually, uh, you know, saying it out, outside. If you see teeth grow long, it's a good sign. If the molars fall out, daughters or sisters will die. If you see a black tooth, trouble will come soon. A loose tooth signifies illness. A loose tooth and then falls out, it foretells death. And this is why we said some people actually fast. If you shave your head in a dream, it's a good sign for you. If you shave, and this is for a man, if you shave your head and your beard, it's a good sign for you and your family. Where are you getting this? I have, this is all sourced from either the Gemara or of Haigon, and there's a Rav Shlomo Al-Moli, all different types of uh, Sfarim that uh, most people haven't. Yeah. So, but that, that's, go look, there's a Gemara in Bachot is, has uh, plenty, plenty of information on uh, different dreams and what they mean. If you see yourself fasting, it's a bad sign. If you see a king in a dream, it's a good sign. You'll attain greatness. If you see a slave in a dream, it's a bad sign. Maid servant is a good sign. Okay. Isn't slave and maid servant the same thing? No, man, man slave versus a woman slave. Oh. Now, uh, okay, so this, there's going to be a lot of things that um, 
is very not only forbidden but very disgusting in real world but it actually when it happens in a dream it, it actually pretends to, to foretell actually a good sign right so again this is only in the dream and it's going to be a little bit twisted so stay with me if someone uh, has in his dream that he's committing incest with his mother he should look forward for under understanding for a bina which is a good sign and uh, the Rav Haigoin says also this denotes that you will live a good life and may look forward to obtaining understanding. If in the dream so this person, this man, is committing incest with his sister, look forward to wisdom. If somebody who in his dream is committing adultery with a married woman, he is to be sure that he has a share in the world to come. Yeah. Now, the obvious question is what's going on over here? So the, the Gemara also explains it. It says this is, the condition is that he doesn't know about this woman. Which means it's not that he's fantasizing about his neighbor and then he dreams about her. That's a very big sin. But I'm talking about this person who's never seen this woman before. He knows that she's married and in his dream, the whatever, you know, he has this type of dream, it's a good sign. Right? If you see a woman giving birth, it is not a good sign. If you see a bed that is made, it's a good sign. And then now we're talking about people that have relate the from a man's perspective. If a man has relations with another man in his dream, evil times will befall him. Not a good sign. If he lies with a menstruating woman, it's a bad sign. If he lies with a prostitute, it's a good sign. It signifies improved circumstances. So again, some of these things doesn't make any sense, but again, that's the, the, uh, the interpretation. If you see yourself staying in a cemetery overnight, you will spend a night in jail. If you see yourself kill someone, a miracle will be performed for you. And again, wow. not that you're actually fantasizing about killing somebody, <laughs> which you should never. Here's the, probably one of the most interesting ones, is when the people see dead people. So if you see yourself dead, first of all, that's a good sign. It means that, so there's one by dying, and there's one that, if you see yourself dead, that means that you've done something which God brings you close for him, and life will be added to a person's years. So uh, if you see, it's so now if the dead person takes from, something from the house, it's a good sign, except for a shoe or a sandal. And anything that it puts down is a good sign, except for dust or mustard. It's a gemara and bachot. If you see dead bodies in a dream, if you are healthy, have no fear. But if you are not feeling well, you're sick, you're ill, it's a bad sign. Here's probably the most famous one. If you see a dead relative coming to you, right? So if you see general, the general thing is if you see a dead relative come to you, it's a good sign. It's a sign for wealth. If the dead person comes and embraces you or kisses you, or even more, if it bites you, it's a bad sign. Trouble will come. If a corpse, this, this a corpse actually gives you something, it indicates an improved circumstance. If you see a deceased parent, father or mother, a joyful occasion will be yours, which means they're coming and they're, there's something that's happy will be coming to you. And if they give you something, all the more so. And this is also why sometimes you have people that, um, you know, they, they dream about their parent and there's a lot of times where, you know, the parent's happy, the parent's sad, it's dark, the parent's crying. There's different things that come into effect as well. But that's good, father or mother? Yeah. Wait, so if there's a dead relative and they give you something, it's bad or good? If they give you something, it's a good sign. It's a good sign, except, um, so let's say, if they take something, it's a good sign, except for a shoe or a sandal. If they give you something, it indicates an improved circumstances. However, okay, let me add this idea, but if it's something that begins with the letter nun, or the letter lamed, so this is again in Hebrew, uh, it's not a good sign. But generally, everything else, not the letter nun or lamed, it's, it's a good sign. This is, uh, the source of that is of high going. Okay, so if, you see yourself buried. Not a good sign. You will be given over into a power of a cruel person. If you see yourself in burial clothes, then you have performed a, a deed which God will bring you close to him. If you see that you have lost your clothes, it signifies a loss. If you see, if it's a man, and he's wearing his wife's clothes, that means that she will inherit him. Okay, if, and a man, if let's say he's wearing a talit, a new prayer shawl, he will get married. You will? Get married, yeah. Only if it's new? Particularly new, yeah. If you see your clothes suddenly get burned up, you will profit. If you see yourself naked, it signifies shame or trouble. If you see thunder or lightning without rain, your generation is sinful and God is angry with them. However, if you see thunder and lightning and rain together, it signifies good. It's a good sign. If you say amen, yehesh merabba, in your dream, it means that you have a share in the world to come. If you see yourself as a school teacher, you will be a ranking official. If you see yourself reciting Shema, you are worthy of having the divine present rest on you, which is a very good sign. If you see yourself putting on tefillin, it's also a good sign. Look forward to greatness. But then again, remember the story we said with tefillin originally, that it's not always, you know, depending, there's a lot of other factors that come into play. There are certain, being that we're running out of time, there are certain uh, uh, foods um, that uh, affect the dream. And we don't have 
really that much time for it, but there are certain foods that are associated with different uh, mazalot, with different uh, constellations, right? So in general, foods that are associated with Mars are denote falsehood. And eating these type of foods will uh, re result in false dreams. Foods associated with Mercury, Saturn, and the Sun, however, are true. You know, maybe we have two minutes. Let me just say it quickly. So let me, let me give you the list of what, uh, what it says over here. Right? The source for this is also of Shlomo Amoli's uh, Sefer on Dreams. He has it in the back. He has a section about this. So he says, the things that are associated from Mars, which are falsehood, are trees which have thorns, pears, peppers, mustard, cumin, radish, leek, garlic. And a few other ones, I have no idea what they are. I don't know how to pronounce them, so I'm not going to say them. <laughs> uh, the next is Jupiter. Jupiter is like deer, chicken. Nobody really eats deer, chicken, peaches, hazelnut, almonds, nuts. Wait, what is this for? What does it do to you? So, so things that which Mars are not a good sign, which was the first thing that we said. That's falsehood. The you foods. See them in the dream. No, no, no. This is if you eat it. If you eat it beforehand. Foods associated with Mercury, Saturday, and the Sun, however, are more likely to give you real dreams. Because this is like very deep stuff. So just either take it or leave it. You know, don't uh, worry too much about it. Um, don't start. You know, like wait a minute. I want to have good dreams tonight, so I'm going to avoid this. You know, if you have a salad, don't start picking it out. This is just like an FYI type of uh, information. All right, I will skip. Let's. Uh, I'll go to the Saturn. Saturn is like carob, carob. Um, to help with real this one, well, the ones I'm saying now. Uh, so, this, so it's uh, carob, crab apples, lentils, and things from the sun is sheep, grapevine, olive, apples, berries, and figs. So he asked apples. Apples is good. Crab apples. I have no idea. I literally have no idea, but it's some sort of apples, I'm assuming. Oh, yeah, you'll know. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. That's why it says, he, he plays a plays and he says, all dreams go after the mouth. Literally, they go after what you put in your mouth. That's how it goes yeah. after it. There's actually also, there's a, which we don't have time for, but there's actually, it, through the Jewish calendar date, if you dream on a certain date, it means a different thing. And it literally goes through every single date throughout the month, right? Oh, one gosh. through 30, which uh, we don't really have the time to um, actually go through it because I want to finish up with one last story uh, before I finish. Any, oh yeah, let's leave the questions for that. Let's leave the questions. Let me say the story and then we'll leave the questions for that. So um, there was once, uh, this story I found in a, uh, Non-Jewish, uh, um, you know, and it's called oh, the Secret World of Dreams. That's where I found it. So, in this story, they bring down this case that there was a woman that uh, was became very sick. She was a 47-year-old uh, drama teacher from Boston. Does it say her name? Yeah, Claire Sylvia, a 47-year-old uh, drama teacher from Boston. In uh, in 1983, she was diagnosed with primary pulmonary hypertension, which is a very um, grave disease that could to lead to death. And um, she, you know, slowly became worse and worse and worse until, you know, she was on a respirator. She couldn't do anything at uh, 47 years old. And the doctors told her the only thing that you could have that could save you is only a transplant. You need a, a lung transplant and a heart and a lung transpla tra uh, transplant, right? And obviously the risks for that are very high. So the story goes that, that before she even got the, this, this transplant, she had a dream. In the dream, she had a dream that she had the, the, the this transplant, and they told her that she has to drink four glasses of milk a day. That's one in the dream, and she thought it was very weird, and she pushed it aside. A short while later, she gets a call, and it was a transplant coordinator, and they told her, hey, listen, we have a donor for you. Uh, please come in immediately. Right? And she was like ecstatic. Was like, you know, the, the, actually, she, she, she writes a story. She says the coordinator was like very nonchalantly. Hey, by the way, so we have a donor for you. We got some pure of you know, lungs and a heart for you. Why don't you come in and roll by whenever you have a chance? You know, and she's like, oh, you, can, you know, and she runs in. And um, she didn't even think about it. And she goes and she's rushed into surgery. And when, right after surgery, after, when somebody has a transplant, they have to take a drug called cyclo cyclosporin. If I'm pronouncing that right, yes. they that drug is an oh yeah thank you. So uh, um, that drug is for it, it for it prevents from the body rejecting the actual uh, transplant, and the doctors right after the right after the transplant they gave her this this medication, but they gave it to her two um, capsules with well, they gave it to her two in the morning and two in at night, and each time with a glass of milk. So she even dreamt already beforehand that she was supposed to drink four glasses of milk. She didn't even put the two and two together yet, and. The story goes on is that, that you know, the transplant was a success. And you know, after, it actually, this transplant happened in, the, uh, in May in 1988. And this was the first, um, it was actually done in Connecticut Yale's New Haven Hospital. And it was the first successful lung heart transplant for in a female. Um, and it says like five days later, there was a bunch of journalists uh, you know, that came over to interview her after, you know, how do you feel, first female, you know, whatever. You know, so she felt, so the first thing that came out of her mouth was, you know what, I could die for a beer right now. <laughs> and the second that she says that, she thinks, she's like, wait a minute. He's like, I don't like beer. 
And she's like, all right, whatever, that's weird. You know, and um, it, the, after she went, she went to rehab, and after she came home, she was, uh, you know, the first time that she was allowed to drive, she realized she was driving to KFC, Kentucky Fried Chicken. This is obviously not a Jewish story. So uh, um, she goes, and she doesn't understand. She doesn't like Kentucky Fried Chicken. And she went, and she had a craving for Kentucky Fried Chicken. And it was very, you know, there was weird things that she started liking green peppers, which she used to always hate green peppers. She used to always pick them out of the salad. Now she saw them eating green peppers by, without it. So one day she had, she had a dream. And in her dream, she sees a person, a young man, by the name of Tim L. That's all that she, the information that she gives. And th they're like having a good time together. They're sort of like in a, in a type of a dating situation. And she sees like before that he's about to leave, she embraces him. And then she sort of inhales him inside of her. And in her dream, she realizes that this person is really inside of her, that this, this transplant that she got was part of this person. And uh, so she woke up, and she was very troubled by it. So she went to the hospital and said, listen, can you give me the records? Can, can I see who actually gave me the, the transplant? And obviously, the person's no longer alive, but she wanted to know, you know who gave her the transplant. And he said, you know, the hospital policy is that we don't, they, can't, they don't reveal. They can't reveal this information. As much as she tried to beg, they wouldn't give her anything. So she eventually um, she dropped it. But she had a friend that called, that call, that it was a man friend, that called her the next day and says, listen, I had a crazy dream, and I think I might be able to help. So I had a dream that we're in a certain public library, and we were looking a few days before your transplant, there was an accident. Uh, and we were looking, it was page three or four of the paper, and in there was, was a person that you had the, um, you know, this, this transplant from. So there's a bunch of dreams going on in this story. And uh, she said, fine. The next day they met, they went to this actual, um, this to this actual uh, uh, library. They went down over there and they opened up the, the paper from a few days before they started looking at it. And surely it was page three, and either page three or four, a day before the, the surgery, there was a person, it was an 18-year-old uh, person by the name of Tim L that was in a car accident and he you know, passed away. And she found out, she ended up actually meeting her family, the, the, the person's family. And he was into beer. And she also realized things changed about her. She liked the certain colors and that she never used to like before. She used to like pink. Now she liked green and black. She used to, you know, and she even said she saw herself looking at a woman the way that uh, a man looks at a woman. Yes. Yeah. So she, you know, this, this whole story, there's a lot of different lessons that, that, you know, she literally has that other person in her, right? This is also where you, you learn. That's your story. This is not, yeah, the old, you can look it up. The is not in the heart, so like, how does that even... There is, there is part of a, there is part of a, the part of the person went, you know, stayed, stayed in, obviously. This is also why you learn, so, you know, people that, you know, how important it is to eat kosher. You know, this is just a, a part, but when you eat, when you eat non-kosher food, that actually becomes part of you. The food gets dissolved into the, well, I'm sitting here in front of a, you know, a nutritionist and a, you know, pharmacist. You guys, what happens to the food? It turns, it, after the body digests it, it goes into the blood, and the blood it, you know, rejuvenates your entire body. So what you eat is literally what you are. So, Am I right? Yeah. Could this also be a reason why Judaism doesn't allow organ donation? Because like, you're giving them... No, it's different. There's, uh, there's other reasons. Who yeah. are what you eat? There, yeah, there are, there's, there's, there's organ donation. There is a certain thing that you could do nowadays, but generally... Um, because maybe it's like as if you're giving a part of it. The real reason is because is it has to be buried, and who knows? Yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of different uh, um, parts that are associated with that. Um, and then now we'll open up to any questions, and I know we are running just exactly on time. So questions, yeah. 